the organ, but we got it today. So thank you, Faith, for doing that. All right, Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to start tonight, and another topical message on discipleship. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, one week ago, uh, I started looking at discipleship, and we looked at several examples. We saw the example of Elijah and Elisha. We saw the example of Timothy uh, and Paul, and of course, Jesus and his disciples. And, uh, and so we saw the, even the culture of the Jewish nation, uh, how it, uh, it really lends to this uh, sharing life together kind of discipleship. And we'd really like to foster discipleship here in our church. And again, it's not a, uh, a curriculum. Uh, it's not something where you sign on the dotted line, okay, I'll be a discipler, and, uh, and here's the disciple, and we go through uh, these 12 lessons, and bada-bing. You know, that's not really what discipleship is, although curriculum can be uh, a helpful tool, and it's important to have a direction, and certainly teaching is part of discipleship, but it's so much more than that. Uh, and so that's what we're learning. That's what we've seen last time as we looked at uh, a biblical pattern, several p- biblical examples of discipleship. Tonight I want to talk about how the church is the natural environment for discipling. And, and it may be that we have this idea that, uh, uh, that we can disciple Apart from the church, I'm going to meet with somebody and I'm going to help them grow in their faith. And, and uh, because of this time that I'm pouring into them, they're going to become mature. And, and, uh, and the Lord may use that, certainly. And of course, uh, God does the work of growing and maturing anyone in the faith. But God has given the church as the natural environment for discipleship. And so to, uh, to pull discipleship out of the church and try to do it separate from the church, uh, we are really uh, cutting ourselves off, you know, at the knees. We're just not going to do well because God has designed discipleship to be done within this environment of the church. And that's what I want to look at tonight, how the church is the correct, the natural and biblical uh, environment for discipling. Of course, uh, we know that discipling doesn't just happen on a Sunday morning, right? Uh, we think church and we think the Sunday morning meeting, you know, or, or the Sunday night or, or Wednesday night or whatever it is, and we think those are the select times for the church. Uh, but, of course, that's not the church, right? In fact, the church is not even this building, right? The church is the people, God's people. And so we are the body of Christ And so within the body of Christ, of which the meeting is just a small part, uh, within the body of Christ, uh, discipleship is meant to happen, and it is a natural environment for it. So we're in Matthew chapter 28, and uh, and this is a uh, passage that we looked at last time. At the very end of the chapter, you see verses uh, 18, 19, and 20. Jesus uh, came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Remember, we looked at that word teach and discovered it's not the typical word for teach, but it is actually make disciples. So disciple all nations. And then we saw how to do that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Of course, this great commission Jesus is giving to his disciples Um, his apostles who would then begin after Christ starts his church they would continue that church work Uh, and so as Jesus discipled his apostles they then would turn around and disciple others this would be the body of Christ and so Jesus forms then this body into an organized body of course the apostle Paul is given special revelation Uh, as to uh, the direction uh, and and the organization of the church and how all that comes together. But here this commission is given to these church leaders. These men that are listening to this commission would then become the elders of the church uh, in Jerusalem. 
they would be the ones that were meeting uh, at, the, at the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 that we looked at this morning. Uh, these, this is the core, this is the beginning of the church right here. So Jesus gives to his church this commission, and the commission is that they ought to disciple. It begins with the church's responsibility to baptize. Baptism is the initiation, really, of disciple work. Baptism is the affirming work of the church, whereby uh, the church recognizes this individual to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are a disciple. They have, uh, they have chosen to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. They belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as a church recognize that that they are a part of the body. And so in that uh, recognition, the church baptizes that individual. And that's another reason why baptism uh, really is best and ought to be done within the, the, uh, the church setting. Now, I know there may be some that, are, that were baptized in kind of a private setting, maybe somewhere, um, but really biblically, baptism is something that is administered by the church, by the believers. It's a recognition of the church. This individual belongs to Jesus, uh, and they are his disciple. And so now the church, having recognized their profession of faith, enters into a discipleship of that individual. That's how it ought to work. Uh, and so all of us, as we witness somebody who's baptized behind these doors or whatever setting it may be when we're together, uh, we kind of take on this responsibility of helping this new disciple, this new individual. They are just getting baptized, displaying their repenting from sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we as a church come along them and help them to grow in their faith. And so the church is this, this important part in the initiation of the discipleship of any individual. And I'm thankful that uh, I was uh, baptized into a Bible-believing church and that through that church I was discipled. Uh, and, and it may have been different ways that you were discipled within the church, um, but it is in that context that that discipleship uh, really works well. And, and that's what Jesus affirms here as he gives that commission to those apostles. So in this discipleship, they're commissioned to go disciple and they begin by affirming who the disciples really are. Who are the disciples? Who really does belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? And if there's an individual that is hesitant and doesn't want to be baptized, then should they be discipled as a Christian? Probably not, because they're reluctant to actually take a stand and say, I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is within the context of the local body uh, that the discipleship uh, is most effective. Now, uh, as I say these things, you might be thinking of uh, situations and circumstances and individuals, you know, that maybe weren't baptized in the church, but they seem to be a believer. And that's fine. God can do that kind of thing, you know. But his design, I want you to know, his design, what he has uh, commissioned his church to do, is to disciple. And so within the context of the local body of believers, that is where disciple is, uh, discipleship is most effective. Uh, so don't think that, uh, that discipleship is just kind of grabbing somebody and going off on your own with them. Uh, it's within the context of the local church. Let's look at a couple other passages that uh, can help us with this. Uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, again, the church is the natural environment for discipleship. Uh, I am very grateful for discipleship programs. Uh, and, and in fact, I've got a little book sitting on my desk right now uh, written by Dawson Trotman of The Navigators just an excellent, an excellent resource. And, and that man uh, was, was gifted by God uh, to develop a discipleship kind of program, but it was specifically within the context of the military, in a context where they were on a ship out in the middle of the ocean for months. <laughs> and, and there is no 
church per se unless they have one right there. And so, uh, and, and the Lord gifted him to, to, uh, to develop a discipleship curriculum and it has been used uh, extensively and wonderfully. Um, but it is best within the church, within the local body of believers. Uh, and, and so I think it's a great resource that the church may use. Hebrews chapter 10 uh, speaks of the importance of our meeting together. Verse 24 of Hebrews 10. And let us consider, when, well, let me back up to 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now think of this, consider that this is a, uh, this profession is pictured in back, baptism. This isn't saying baptism here, but baptism pictures the profession that we make. If you've made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, hold to that. And what better way to do that than by baptism and within the context of the body of believers. So let us hold fast this profession of our faith without wavering. How do we do this? How do we keep from wavering and wondering, am I saved, am I not? You know, do I want to live for Jesus or not? Well, we do what it says in verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. <laughs> That's discipleship, right? That's discipleship. Consider one another. Look out for somebody else and say, hey, I need to provoke them <laughs> in the best way, right? I need, to, I need to stir them up to love and good works. That's what disciples do. And so if we want to have a church of disciples, then we've got a church that is full of people that are looking to the well-being of other Christians in the body, saying, I wonder how they're doing. I wonder how I can encourage them and provoke them to love and to good works. And so within the church context, we have uh, this, this uh, discipleship, but not only with provoking one another to love and good works, but look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. So how does this discipling take place? First, there's a profession of faith. Secondly, there's, there's um, Christians looking for other individuals and how they can encourage them in their faith. And when do they do it? Well, one of the ways that they do it is by meeting together. The assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Now, discipleship does not happen without being intentional. You have to be intentional to disciple someone. And so the church is actually uh, established an intentional meeting with other believers. I mean, how great is that? If, if, you're, if you're in the body of Christ, then you have this time every week where you know at least once, you know, and hopefully more than that, but at least that one meeting, you're going to get to see other Christians. And what a great chance to say, hey, let's get together sometime this week. Uh, I, I'd like to talk to you more about this. How can we build a relationship here? How can we grow one another and provoke one another to love and good works? So the church is the natural environment for discipling because first, it affirms who the disciples are through baptism. Secondly, it has intentional gathering together. It, it provides intentional gathering together in order to disciple, in order to stir one another up unto uh, love and good works. All right, ready? Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 for the next passage here. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 18, uh, and uh, if you are familiar with this chapter, you may uh, know where we're going here. Why is the church the natural environment for discipleship? Because it provides accountability when we fail to live up to that profession that we've made. The church provides accountability. That's why it's such a perfect environment for discipleship, because we need accountability. One of the benefits of meeting with other believers, you know, on a regular basis, is you check up on them. How'd you do with your devotions? Did you read the Bible this week? Uh, how, how have you been doing with this struggle that you have had? Uh, what's your thought life been like? And you have that opportunity to hold each other accountable. Well, the church is established 
uh, with the natural means to hold each other accountable through something that we might call church discipline. And of course, church discipline, you know, it's a, oh, it's a big scary thing that, that we hardly want to talk about. But this is a resource that the church provides as God has established it to do so. And in uh, Matthew 18, look at verse 15. Verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Ah, oh, within a church context, within the body of believers, hey, if there's, a, if there's an offense, if there's something, hey, you know, I was offended by what you said or, or uh, what you've done, you've hurt me in some way. Well, there's this one-on-one, you go to them. And if you don't have a time where you meet together, that's not going to happen. And within the context of the local church, this is that, that accountability. There's something wrong, it needs to be corrected. But what if he doesn't want to hear it? Verse 16, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Okay, you have a group of, of believers, a body of believers, and if, if the one-on-one hasn't worked, well, then it's time to bring somebody else in. Why? Because remember, when we, when we witness and partake in the, the baptism of a new disciple, in some sense we are all saying, we're here for you. And you're here for us, and we're in this thing together. And so that's why it's, it's a totally appropriate to pull in somebody else from that body of believers and say, hey, look, we want to talk to you about this because it's a struggle, and there's a problem, and it needs to be addressed. One-on-one didn't work. Okay, bring two or three more. In the very extreme case, they may have to be disassociated from the church entirely. Uh, And that's what it says there in verse number 17. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever he shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever he shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if uh, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that ye shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. There's a lot that we could look at in that passage, but I just want to highlight this thought that the church, the body of Christ, provides the natural environment for discipling new believers because it provides accountability. Accountability. It's a needed resource. And and if we want to try to uh, disciple somebody without the means of accountability, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle. Uh, And so uh, that's why the context of the local church is just perfect, and it is God's design for discipleship. Okay, here we go. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Let's keep moving along here. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to try to keep it moving. Thinking about discipleship and how the church is the perfect context for discipleship. In Hebrews 13, let's look first at verse number 7, and then we'll skip ahead to 17. So chapter 13 of Hebrews and verse number 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Okay, uh, this, is, this is great. The, uh, the church provides real-life examples for discipleship. Real-life examples. And so uh, when there is, uh, there, there is this, uh, this need to, to grow in your faith, you're looking for somebody who's maybe a little farther along in the faith than you are. And here, specifically in this context, uh, the example would be the, the leadership in the church in this specific verse. Uh, they have spoken to you the word of God. It says, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Look at their lifestyle. How are they living their life? And that can provide you an example to follow, to become more and more like Jesus Christ. How great would it be if you were in a discipleship situation where you're, you're discipling somebody, a new believer, and they're saying, boy, I really struggle with this specific thing uh, in my life. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I know somebody in our church 
that has actually been through that. Hey, let's go talk to them. I mean, you've got a real-life example within the body of Christ uh, that can help that individual through that struggle. That's why the church is a perfect environment for discipleship, real-life examples. Um, in uh, verse, uh, let's look at Titus chapter 2, kind of going along with the same idea here. In Titus chapter 2, once again, the, the apostle Paul, writing this letter, he writes to a, uh, a young pastor... And he gives instructions to this pastor how the church ought to be organized and what ought to take place within the church. Titus chapter 2, look with me at verse 1. Paul says to Titus, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. This is Titus, you better teach right. And here's what you teach, verse 2. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. That the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good, uh, good things. Now look at verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers of, at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Well, who's sober-minded? We saw it earlier in the, in the chapter in verse 1, the aged men ought to be sober, right? They're the ones then teaching the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. The, the local church provides the context for discipleship because you have real life examples. Now listen, this is so important. You can get teaching on the internet. You can get teaching on TV. You can get teaching on the radio, but you can't get the example. You can't get the example. That's why the local body of believers is the place for discipleship. Uh, you, you know, I I could, I could preach and put, and we put our videos up on YouTube or whatever, and people could listen to me, but they have no clue how I live my life. But you do. You know who I am. And you know whether I'm an example or not. And it, we kind of live together in this way. So it, that's why discipleship needs to be in this organic body of believers, because you need real examples, real examples uh, to follow, and, and, uh, and discipleship happens the best, the most effectively uh, within the context of the local church. All right, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've seen that the church is the perfect environment for discipleship because it first affirms who the disciples are through baptism, Secondly, it provides intentional gathering uh, so that we may stir each other up. Thirdly, it provides accountability to keep us on the right path. Fourth, it provides real life examples that we can look to in order to gain the advice and gain the help in order to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Five, we see that the church provides a support system. We need support. We need people to come along and, and, and help us and, and hold us up. And then we need to be able to help others and hold them up. And we need to be part of something organic and, and be able to work with each other and support one another in this discipleship. I'm so glad that I have a support system to help me be like Jesus Christ. You know, people say, well, yeah, you know, you go to church all the time because you're paid to. <laughs> okay. Here's the reality. If I didn't, I'd be falling away from Christ. That's the reality. <laughs> That's why I'm so passionate about it. Because I need what you provide, and you need what I provide. We need one another. This is the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 14. For the body is not one member... But many, if the foot shall say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? 
And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God hath set members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. Okay, that individual that you're discipling or that you want to disciple, they're a part of the body of Christ if they've trusted Christ as their Savior. They're a part of the body of Christ, and they have something to offer to the body of Christ. And so to keep them away is to withhold from them this ability to serve and be a benefit to other people, even though they may be young in the faith. Verse 19, and if they were all, uh, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. You see, we need one another. And a new believer needs the body of Christ. And if they're going to grow in their faith and become like the Lord Jesus Christ, then they've, they've got to have the body of Christ to do it. And so discipleship must happen within the context of the body of Christ, within the local church environment. Uh, the local church provides that support system uh, and that sense of belonging uh, to be a part of the body of Christ. Well, let's look ahead then at Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll finish right here. Ephesians chapter 4, a familiar passage because we've been in this passage several times in our Sunday school hour. And, uh, but Ephesians chapter 4, I want you to see that truly the body of Christ, the church, the local church is the perfect and divine environment for discipleship. You cannot get a better place to disciple somebody than in the local church. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 14. And, and again, the context of this uh, is, is in this, uh, this discussion of the unity of the body of Christ. You see that back in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father, uh, and the unity in verse number 3, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, then skip ahead to verse 11 where we have uh, how, how God has given specifically to the church those that are gifted in these leadership roles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Then the explanation for why they are there, the perfecting of the saints, that's discipling. The work of the ministry, that's discipleship. The edifying of the body of Christ, that's discipleship. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Again, this is the goal for every disciple to become like his master, like Jesus. Verse 14 now, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, the cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacteth by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <laughs> that's discipleship. I mean, that's it. You want to grow, you, you want your disciple to grow, you want uh, others to grow in the church. How does it happen? It happens in the context of the local church. We want to grow up into him. Uh, the illustration always comes to my mind of having a, a, a shirt that's too big. You know, when I was a little kid, I'd get hand-me-downs from my brother. And, uh, and he was a little bit bigger than I was. 
Uh, but I eventually caught up to him, and now I don't know. We're in a competition. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, used to, I used to have to grow into his clothes, right? Eventually, I would grow and mature to where the clothes that he had passed down to me would fit me. That's what we want to do with Jesus. When you put on Christ, you find, you know, there's a lot about Jesus that doesn't seem to fit me too well. I need to grow. I need to grow in my faith and become like Jesus Christ. I need to grow up into him, uh, grow into Christ. And where does this happen? It happens in the local church. It happens by the discipleship available by the commission of Jesus to the local church. Uh, and so we've got to recognize if, if we want to see discipleship happen in our church, then we need to utilize the tools available to us to disciple others within the body of Christ. Use the church. That's what it was designed for, to help you disciple others to become like Jesus. All right, let's pray, and then I'll turn it over to Pastor David here for our prayer time. Our Father, we thank you for helping us to see the importance of discipleship and really to see the environment that the local church provides to make that discipleship happen. Uh, Lord, we want to foster here in our church an environment for discipleship. We want to see Christians growing up into Christ. We want to see ourselves growing up into Christ. And I pray that you would help us to look for opportunities and look for ways that we can foster this environment for the discipleship that you've commissioned us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.